arm off, you'd still call you, you. Yeah? Just me without the arm. But it's still you. Yeah, if I grew more hair, I'd still call me Fabio Hector, but it would be Hector, right? That looked like Fabio. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then for the physical stuff, you don't need to figure this out, but there's some inner stuff and some outer stuff. And the inner stuff is the one for the sense powers, the things that connect us to the outside world. So for light, it's the back of the eye. This is like a plant or a thing that senses light and dark. Yeah, it doesn't sense colors. It doesn't sense. It doesn't sense. It doesn't label things. It just senses at the core level, like a plant would move towards the right. Yeah, the back, the ear drum. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say that's beautiful music. The ear drum is just going back and forth, a little bit back and forth, deeply back and forth. It's sending raw data, so that's inner physical stuff. And then you have all the outer physical stuff, all this stuff that here. We can verify that. And then for mental stuff, we can say, there's my own mental continuum and you seem to be an entity over there with a mind as well, most of the time. Yeah? <laughs> so you can verify that. And that's a really lovely way, I think. <coughs> of course, in, in science, we go to the Bempo in, in the world of science, and we go and, and spend trillions of billions of dollars and time and energy splitting atoms and, and the rest to try and figure out what's behind the stuff that's 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 behind the stuff. That's behind the stuff. And in quantum physics, in the science of quantum, we start bumping into perception, consciousness, merging into physical stuff and we don't have a discipline in the West that looks at that. We call them people crazy. We say they're metaphysics, they're spiritualists, they're weirdos, yeah? If you're in my reality. So, you know, it's not, you don't teach it at school because it's not verifiable, it's not, you know, it's not measurable. But there's a prejudice in that, almost, almost a prejudice that you had when Galileo said you can look at the stars through this telescope, the clergy, the people, the scientists of the day who were indoctrinated with their worldview of the church, <clears> that, oh, God made everything and the earth was at the center of the universe, they didn't want to look through his telescope. Because, and they said, it's written, that if they saw anything at all in there that contradicted what they knew to be true, then it was some kind of magic or some kind of mistake with the equipment. So we have that kind of prejudice with science, but it's, it's leaving the deeper we get into quantum. But we do, in our worldview, have that kind of prejudice. If there's anything, and we have it at work, we bump into it at work, in our relationships at school, we have that kind of prejudice. But you know, even though you can agree it's hard to define and hard to pinpoint that the non-physical world, the mental world, is a functioning thing. You have a mental event. You know, I can put the same object in front of all of you and each of your bodies will have a different reaction to it. You know that. You can measure that scientifically. But every one of your perceptions will be different as well. And that is not physical. Yeah. So that now we begin the whole idea about this two thing. And then if you tie this idea back to causality, cause and effect, cause and effect, and like produces like, equal and opposite reaction, like produces like, then you've got to say, the stuff that is woody makes woody stuff. The solid stuff makes solid stuff. Yeah? The mental stuff makes mental stuff. And you can verify that with your own experience. If you sit there and habituate your mind to look for a specific thing or to feel a specific thing on an object like Pavlov's dog, you can, you can force your mind to have a perception because of habituation, mental habituation over time, which means your <coughs> mental habit produces your mental experience. We do this. That's why we send people to school. So we figure if we get their mental habit in first grade, then they're good enough to fill that up and that will produce their understanding for second grade. And that will produce our understanding for them. That's why we do that. It's not physical stuff, it's mental stuff. 
we have an understanding of it, but we don't call it science. So we've got to think that the proof of future lives comes from this idea, like produces like, and the law of karma, which we'll do on Tuesday, is that that production expands, the result is bigger. It's similar, but it's bigger than the cause. The cause came before the result. There's all these laws that we agree intuitively, but these guys have studied and meditated for thousands of years. So, if we're talking about all existing things, let's look at... He <laughs> <laughs> <you> woke up. <laughs> yeah? What produced that light? What produced that light in, in there? You know? Lego. So, uh, Lego. Lego, yeah, thank you. Lego made it. Um, so, causality and all existing things in relation to the mind oh my God. and the charbikas, the, there's this group of people, I can't remember the dates, there's a debate, a recorded debate, where the Buddhists were arguing around India to refute the idea that you just stopped. The you, the mind, your consciousness, your <coughs> being, stopped because your body stopped. Yeah, and so the logic, the logic that comes in this course comes from this debate with the charvikas, and it says the mind is a quality of the body. So they would say the charvikas, there's something about your body that has a quality of mind. So if you kill the body, the mind must stop, right? Like getting drunk is a quality of alcohol. Yeah. So, do you see that? So the Charvika said something like that. So the Buddhists refuted that. And then they say the mind is by nature dependent on the body in the way that a design, uh, a design that you put on a wall is dependent upon the wall. So if you're doing a drawing here, you need a wall to have a drawing. Yeah, they say like that, the mind is dependent on. Um, I know this might be getting a little bit too deep into it, but could you define what they mean by mind? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. What's the definition of mind? Clarity and awareness. Not physical. <laughs> Not physical is one of the uh, omissions, but clear and aware. Yeah. It's, it's awareness. This I'm I'm lumping in this whole category because it's hard to define. Yeah. Um, Non-physical stuff. The consciousness. The thing that is listening to me, the thing that's interpreting and feeling, or, or your or what we call conscious and subconscious, feeling, all that stuff lumped together, we call mind. You have your main mind, which is your general awareness, that is what Steve said, and then you have all the other 51 mental functions, which are feeling, and discrimination, and the rest, all these things are not physical, findable things. If you put a bomb next to mind, you couldn't explode it because it's not made out of atoms. Yeah. In the West, we think mind is the brain. It is not the brain. The closest we call it is the soul, but the implication of the idea of soul here is that somebody made it, that it's going through your... etc. So I'm avoiding that word altogether. But that thing, which together with your body, you call you, that thing perceiving you, yeah? It's a good thing to investigate. So the charvikas of the mind said, that me, that mind, is dependent on the body. Therefore, if you stop the body, that thing stops. There's no more you, there's no more mind, there's no more perception, there's no more feeling, none, none of that stuff. And then they say also that the mind is a result of the body in the way that uh, light is a result of a lamp. And so the Buddhist went, oh, hold on a second. Let's go back to that whole division of everything. And I, I say to you that my physical things produce physical things. Like a seed produces a tree. Like sand can be turned into glass. It's physical, <coughs> solid, 3D stuff. It's got that similar quality. And if that's true for everything then the consciousness, the awareness, the mind is also caused by something similar, which is mind, which is consciousness, which is aware. And to summarize the proof, but let's see, we, we, we ask the questions, right? Why can't we say to the Charvikas, 
Where are we? Are we there? Hello? Hello? <coughs> Uh oh, is there? It says elimination, maybe that happened. Elimination. <laughs> by, by, by the process of elimination. So first, you know, uh, you have this thing with life, yeah? From ah, bing, he's got life. Why can't we say it comes from physical stuff? Yeah, so the Buddha say, look, it doesn't come from physical stuff. It doesn't come from matter. It doesn't come from outer matter or inner matter. It doesn't come from another person's mind, like your mum and dad. So let's... Let's look at chemicals. If you put a bunch of chemicals together, does that, you know, if I if I grab a, a bunch of chemicals, we have this belief system, and then if I grab all those chemicals together, I'm going to have consciousness. We we know that's not true because we can have all the chemicals that brought us together at the time of birth in one petri dish, and there's no life coming up. Does it come from an outer matter? Here they're talking about earth, water, wind, etc., which is another field of study altogether. Does that, if you bunch a whole bunch of physical stuff outside mm -hmm. together, push it together, will you have an arising of life, of a being, of an aware being, of a conscious being? So the Buddha say, no, that's impossible because physical produces <coughs> physical, mental <coughs> produces mental. And then you, the, you, the last question, well, then is it your mum and dad's mind that made their mind, yeah? Is it them? Did your mum lose a bit of her mind when she <laughs> had you? Probably yes. Yeah. yeah. But did your dad? <laughs> no. <laughs> so is your mind a section of your mum's mind? Do you have her memories? Do you have her feelings? Do you have her thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, I was just going to say, yeah. There's like, I don't know. I mean, I've studied a little bit of neuroscience and that. I don't know, I just, I'm having trouble accepting it, but I'm sure it goes like much deeper. It goes way, way deeper. Yeah, I'm giving you the, the bare essence. But the bare essence should be enough to, to question. <coughs> if you had your mom's mind, she could read your thoughts. It's her mind. She could have her thoughts. In, she could know what you're thinking right now. She should know. It. It's her mind. It started that way. Debate, please. Debate. <laughs> 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 no, I'm, I'm going to agree. For the but time. No, but you don't have to agree. You should have it as a question mark. You, right. You should have it as a question mark. And you shouldn't agree, agree, agree. You should think about it. Is that any, did any, at any point of your life, did you really have a whole field of awareness that was your mother's or your father's? Did they have a little bit less mind after they had you? <clears throat> did they lose some memories? Did they lose some feeling? Did they lose some discrimination? Do they lose some awareness? Do they lose some consciousness? Are they 80% less? 50% less? 98%? Not 2% less? Like that. That's how you should think about it. So anyway, this was the argument for, from, from the Buddhist's point of view. They, they're saying, in essence, here's the, the chunk of it in, in 10 to 9 minutes. If physical produces physical, and the result is similar to the cause, then the result that you're having about being aware and conscious right now is a production of a previous moment of mind. It came before. And all the crap you put into your mind this morning produce your awareness right now. And all the good stuff you put in your, in your mind this morning produces your perception later. The more angry I get at the guy that's beeping the horn, the next time I hear a horn, and my mind will interpret that sound, which has no nature from its own side, will interpret it like I've been habituating my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess, um, just like a simple version of what I would argue is like certain colors, right, have um, certain emotional connotations for humanity in general. Mm -hmm. Like, yellow generally means caution, and sure. red is like passion, lust, death, etc. And those memories, I guess it's been argued, or I've read that it's been argued, have been passed down from like when we were, you know, crawling around somewhere. So they learned, you say? In um, a way, yeah. Because yellow means stop in every culture. Well, no, the idea, no, 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 not in, in the sense of traffic necessarily, but yellow is, is um, cautionary. Mm -hmm. I guess. Is it just a, a convention we've adopted and therefore it functions? 
My argument I would say it that. functions before we adopt it. Like, like there's been. You're saying that's why we adopted it because right. it functions that way. Right. I, I agree with you to some degree, but the the proof that it doesn't come from the object is that not everybody that sees yellow responds in exactly the same way. If they did, then that thing came from yellow. The reaction must have come from yellow. The fact that we all agree yellow should give us caution and we have a feeling that it gives us caution, that's no problem. We share that perception, like we share being human. The, the other thing that will go is, let, let me take you back. If the mind that you've got now was produced by the mind that you developed a year ago, and the mind that you developed a year ago was the cause for the mind, was produced by the mind you developed five years ago and three years ago and two years ago and so on. And you begin to build on those conventions. Yellow means caution. And you believe that and you either got it taught or whatever. Yeah, That's all fine. No problem with that at all. That, co that causality of current mind stream is not a problem at all. That, that's how you build knowledge. That's why we're in class. We're now beginning to have a convention around Lego figures. I mean, how do you know that light means life? It's, it doesn't mean you know, huh? It's a death ray. <laughs> it's a death ray. <laughs> you know, but to me, it meant to be life. But we, we're beginning now. I label it. We share the label. We begin to rethink it. Every time we see that light now, we, next time I show it to you, you'll think what I'm trying to imply. That's learned behavior. That's no problem. The mind does that. We mold the mind. It changes. Let's take the mind, if the color of your mind now, the flavor of your mind now, is the stuff you've been building up in your mind, like that, from before, and before, and before, and before, and before. And you can say it's imbued by the colors that we share in our culture, the colors that we share in our society, the colors we share in our family, the colors we share in our school, the colors we share in our, in our home. So a loud noise, a burp, at the table in Italy means such an awesome meal and it means something terrible somewhere else. Using your left hand in Indonesia to pick up food is disgusting and not anywhere else. You know, so those learnt things, I, I, I can agree, are learnt. But your mind has this cause and effect from mind. Yeah? Perception forms on perception, forms on perception, which then perception is existence, is reality. My question is, if you take your mind back, your mind, your consciousness, your awareness, your feelings, sensations, awareness, etc., to when you were birthed, and you have this, as a, you must, re, you must assume that you had some response to the stimuli in your environment at birth, when you got pushed out, and out you came, took your first breath. Your mind must have had a first moment of ah. Oh, and you say, well, it's probably had moments of awareness and consciousness and sensation, even at a primal level in the womb. But it's move in the tummy. We know that. The studies that say they, they must feel something. So where did the perception of that sensation come from? Well, you, you have to say the moment before. You say the moment before. And let's go to the very first moment in this life Egg and sperm have come together, and at some point, we don't know when, the Tibetans say, or the Buddhists say, at the moment of conception, mind begins. Yeah? It had its first primordial sensation. That its mind, its awareness, its consciousness labeled, even if it was a label of, oh, yeah? Because that has a sense. The mind moved. That's, that's what I'm trying to describe. The description was the mind moving, having a sensation. If mind produces mind, if everything has a cause, what caused that first moment? And that's where the question is, did it come from mum and dad? Did it come from the sperm and egg? Did it come from all the other chemicals running around? Did that first sensation of pleasure or comfort or darkness or tightness or moving or move my leg. Something's forcing it to move its leg in the tummy, the fetus. <clears throat> it's either a discomfort or a moving towards comfort. Something is making it move. It's sensing something. So if you take physical producing physical and mental, this is Dignodus and Mastodamakirti's core argument. <coughs> Everything is caused. <clears throat> but there are streams of causes. Mental produce mental. Physical produces physical. 
you can verify in your lifetime that your worldview is based on what you habituated your world. So what the hell produced your first private, separate moment of ah? Oh. Sorry. I still, I'm having trouble accepting like mental always producing mental and physical always producing physical. Like, can it go all? They can influence each other, but then you'd have to, you'd have to dig deep. And this course goes to some level, the 15 years in the monastery goes at a deeper level of let's go, okay, let's go logically, moment, bit by bit. Thus, putting together a bunch of sperm and a bunch of egg in one place always produce a fetus you know does those two can those two physical things always produce a life if if that was the cause if that was the neural EQ, the thing that flopped into a being not a physical arm that grew yeah but a being with consciousness then every time you grab 20 million sperm and five eggs or whatever you must have a flopping thing with awareness. If that wasn't the cause, then if that wasn't the case, that every time you put them together, you always got a consciousness, a mind, and awareness, then that's not the cause. That could be a condition that's prerequisite for the cause, but the cause must be something else. And the argument is that oh, it's quite obvious it's the mind. It's mind producing mind. It takes some investigating because it goes so against our Galileo prejudices. Yeah. You know? We think what we learned is truth, like Galileo's friends. That was the doctrine of the time. It's our science is our voodoo. And because it functions 98% of the time. But when it comes to this little weird section, it's like, oh, I'm not sure. It's going again. I'm losing my ground. I can't think about it. But if, what if this was the fundamental question? Because here's the implication. Imagine that that were true. That that first moment of awareness in that in that being's moment on this planet on at this time was produced by a previous moment of mind, and it wasn't the mum's mind, and there was no mind to be had in any physical matter outside. It was mind producing mind. It was like a stream, the continuum of that same mind, flopping that flavor onto this life. So why do some children like salty things and some children like sweet things? And why do some children play music beautifully and others are tone deaf? And why do some babies smile when a big bearded person goes up to them and other people start crying, you know? What is it that gives us these flavors? They're all moments of mind. Something caused them. We can't say that everything has a cause except that. That's prejudice. So the argument is, do you get the argument? The argument is, every response to stimuli is interpreted by our minds differently. And yes, we share some cultural, yes, we share some family, but my sister and I have the same upbringing, and she's a bitch, I'm so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, but my mum was exactly the same to this to my twin brother, and he turned out to be much more clever than me, or whatever. Straight. Straight. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so you have to consider that each being on this planet has its own continuum. You have your own continuum. If it's if it's just like the Charikas say, you end, like when the car crashes, the driver must be dead. <laughs> that's that's the metaphor, you know. Every time you see a car crash, you must assume that the driver is dead because the car is not moving anymore. That's not true. Sometimes the car crashes, it doesn't go anymore, and the driver walks out. Something's driving <clears throat> the body. Your, your mind is not dependent on the body. The argument actually goes the other way. The argument is that you cannot have a body were it not for a mind. And that goes into a whole different thing. Mind produces the reality of body, the perception, the prana body of this specific body. But how is that not mind producing physical? Ah, uh, no, it isn't. It's the perception of body. Ah, okay. Ah, physical produces physical. Sperm and egg will get two cells, four cells, sixteen cells, etc. Okay. Until you got this. But the life in it, the, the consciousness in it, the perception. 
of it, that's a different thing. They come together. They call them like horse rider and horse. They influence each other, but they are separate things. We we are mistaken to think like the Spanish thought, like the indigenous Americans thought when they saw the Spanish land on horseback, yeah. that it was one creature with four legs and a torso, a human torso. Wait, wait did you say it was a separate thing? They are separate things. The body and the mind are separate things. Physical and mental are separate things. They're still changing things. They influence each other. Yeah? Physical produces physical. Mental produces mental. This is the idea. Let me quickly give you an insight onto the real life. Are you there? When you see this painting, this is called How Things Come to Be, Dependent Origination. One interpretation of the wheel of life, there are many, if you've seen this drawing, is the three life cycles that produce the continuum of mind. These first two up there, saying ignorance and karma, the conditioning of being, produces the first, which is consciousness, and then which is um, name and form and sense, powers, contact, feeling, desire, grasping and becoming. And then you flop over into birth, aging and death, which is the last one. Yeah. When, so to interpret that, you, you should think when you, if you've studied the wheel of life, that dependent origination has many ways to be interpreted. And here is one explanation from the Buddha about past and future lives, saying the way you've conditioned karma will produce the kind of flavors you like when you're a baby. Will will produce whether or not you're virtuoso or or stone deaf. Yeah. And then you've got a whole bunch of time in this current life to reshape that moldable thing which is your mind. And, and you know this if you've lived long enough. If you're really good at studying piano, and you've studied it for five years, and then ten years go past and I put you in front of a piano, your mind begins to go, I can do that. If you've never studied piano, and I put you in front of a piano, you might sound different, unless you have seats from before. And some people can do that. How come? Where does that come from? If everything is caused, don't section out perception. Don't section out internal reality. So let me tell you what they say forces. This is getting more advanced beyond your question. I didn't answer it fully, I know. But this is going a little bit beyond that, saying let's let's say that we won the argument with a char because saying, of course, you idiots, it's not physical, it's mental, mental causes mental. Now let's let's go and consider what is it that flops over into another life? What is it that forces the perception of a new life within the cycle of samsara, <coughs> within the cycle of suffering? And they say it's the eighth link, it's a uh, which is desire or craving. So it's the craving desire for three things. Uh, the first one is... Uh, hmm? The, the wanting things you like ignorantly, like, ah, if I get this, I'm going to be happy. If I get this, I'm going to... So that builds some desire. The second desire is getting away from things that are hurt you, averting like the ignorant desire, the things in the center of the will. But the one, the main one, the biggest one that forces the production of your next incarnation, that your mind begins to, beyond death, at the moment of flatlining, <coughs> your body is finished. Your mind continues. But it can't be here anymore. So where is it? It is producing its perceptions. The thing that flops over into forcing this kind of experience again, which isn't somewhere out there in Pluto and then it comes back, it's it's your perception of this thing. If everything is empty, this arm can one moment be an arm and the next moment be a dead arm and then the next moment be a cockroach leg. It's just an extremity. It doesn't have a nature of arm. So what is it that forces me to see arm, aging arm? This is a big question. Hold on. And what they say is what forces that perception to continue, that the inertia to continue rolling in these cycles is this last desire, the, the desire for me, or the me grasping me. The whole identity of me, 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 <laughs> not you, and I grab this and not that. And this fear of disappearing is actually what causes us to continue in an ignorant way. Not knowing that we will, nothing can stop us. 
Nothing stops mind. It's infinite. It had no beginning. It has no end. It only has a... It can be tutti frutti or it can be vanilla. It will continue to be. If you relax into that, if you get some insight into that with logic that's either direct or indirect, yeah, through reasoning, and you relax, you lose your grip on this me, which stops the, can stop the cycling in samsaric suffering. This is the core of it. So then you go into the monkey grasping, and then that flops over into your next life. Can I have a quick question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so does that, could that also mean that if, say you were afraid of becoming enlightened, would that <laughs> push you? Yeah. Would you become enlightened then? Well, then you must think about enlightenment in some self-existent way. If you, if you think, you must think about enlightenment in some self-existent way, or the fact that you won't be here in a self-existent way, or that you won't be able to help the self-existent beings that won't self-existently see you. There's some self-existence. Whenever there's fear, there's self-existence. Yeah, That's what my answer is. I'm not going to go into that. You can go look at that. This is heavy. But the, in practice, here it is. Ready? This is the... the just be. <laughs> be <laughs> the best you can be. That's you. Be, yeah, did I say you? Best you. Hmm? You, you. You, That's you. You, you, you can be. You. Be, you, you can be. Yeah. So what I'm saying is... <laughs> <laughs> That's you, 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 you can be. I did this quickly, all right. Um, and <laughs> no, no, I, I was trying to think, how do you put these ideas into practice? You can't. You have to investigate them because it goes totally against um, materialistic prejudices that we were taught from birth in our society. This is a different way to perceive who you are and what you are. This is an infinite way. The implications are big. If every single thing that you do is recorded, but not by some bearded dude up in the sky that you'll meet when you flatline and he says, you know, you did this and this and that, now go into the corner and be naughty or be nice. It's not like that. There is a list kept. It's a rolling list. And it's in your self-awareness. It's recorded in your consciousness. It colors your mind. It forces your reality. There is a list kept. You keep it. There's no one else keeping it. There's no one else in there. <laughs> there is a list. You keep the list. That list is the building blocks for your future. And you can interpret it as your long-term future or next week's future. So the only way to change those building blocks, to improve those building blocks, is to be the most beautiful be you can be here. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I was trying to think, what should I do for practice? You know, you should meditate, you should investigate. Yes, you should do all those things. But at some point, you should be aware and laugh, and just laugh and laugh. That'll produce love. <laughs> be happy, that'll produce happy. Don't punch the guy beep in the horn. Let's dedicate. Okay. I you think the army is going to see you. Huh? Yeah. Oh, you can. Army beep for me. Okay, good. Great. Now, thank you, Stephen. Uh, <laughs> do you want to do the sashi? Sashi. Hoki jushin me top trump. Rira Lung Shi Nyan De Gyan Padi Sung De Shin Du Ni Te Du Ar Gi Nero Ku Nam Da Shin La Chu Pa Sho Idam Guru Rat Nam Andala Kam Nin Yatayami
broader awareness, a questioning awareness, whatever it is that lets you investigate your reality, dedicate it to others. Like you should imagine people you care about who are a bit lost, uncertain of the world, want to make sense of it all. Just whatever efforts you've made tonight, make sure that the result of that ripens upon them in your mind as them finding their answers for whatever they're seeking. As many people as you can imagine. And if you have a teacher, make sure they're watching. They have. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget, the three jewels needs you. Um, <laughs> if, you are, if you are here, the place is open thanks to the grace of donations. I highly encourage it. Momo's 